All right. Now, in this lecture, we are going to talk about the chemical shift and its measurement. Like we said earlier, the general idea behind NMRO is that we have a sample that contains nucleus. Let's say this is a sample that contains the various nucleus. In this case, let us say a proton. All right? Now, we say that this nucleus can actually orient in different directions, right? But in the presence of an external magnetic field, in the presence, let us say this is an external magnetic field with positive charge and negative charge. What will happen? We say that this nucleus here have the ability to precess. That means the spin, right? They behave like a spinning top. I've explained this before. Right? They have the ability to what? To precess in such a way that some will align with the field while others will align against the field. Of course, if you understand physics very well, you, understand, you agree with me that this field will be going from this positive direction towards the word negative. So this field is in this direction like this. Now we say some of these protons here so we'll actually align with the field i will say this on their low energy why there are some that will actually what go against the field we will say this on their what high energy nucleus now we said that this process by which um an standard magnetic field is being attached or is being applied to a nucleus in order to change the spin orientation of that nucleus is actually accompanied accompanied rather by a particular frequency which we call the precessional frequency now for most of these um, instruments that we are using the feed strength is usually 1.4 tesla so when you see 1.4 t it's actually giving you information about the field strength strength now most times whenever this field the electric field is attached um listen to the frequency with which this nucleus precess is 60 megahertz so we can say precessional frequency is equals to 60 megahertz so most instruments usually precess with what this 60 megahertz now how about a situation where we increase the feed strength to let's say 14 tesla 14 tesla it means we increase it by a factor of 10 abby because 1.4 to 14 means you multiply by 10. it also means the precessional frequency will increase by how many by 10. so we are going to have precessional frequency equals to 600 megahertz are you getting it now now the precessional frequency of protons in the same electric field is the same the precessional frequency of protons in the same electric field is, is the same there are a number of factors that actually determine this now but a man discovered that when they place ethanol the structure of ethanol is something like this ch3 ch2 oh now they place ethanol in the same electric field what did we say here that the precessional frequency of protons in the same electric field is what is the same but when they place ethanol using the same electric field they discovered that the precessional frequency are different do you understand the concept the precessional frequency of protons in the same electric field are the same so by right if this ethanol is a compound by right all the protons in ethanol are supposed to have the same precessional frequency that means this ethanol if you apply a magnetic field to this ethanol all the protons here are supposed to have one frequency at which they what the process that is that spinning top are you getting it now now 
But a man discovered that when he actually placed this ethanol, the values of the precessional frequency for the protons were different. And this actually marked the beginning of the use of NMRO as a tool for structural elucidation. And the first man that actually carries, uh, carried out this was a man called Placard in 1951. Is that okay? In 1951, by right, we said that the precessional frequency of all protons in the same electric field should be what? The same. But the man said, when he carried out the experiment for that of um, ethanol, he discovered that this CH3 came out different, this CH2 came out different, and this proton here came out different. That means the protons in CH3, protons in CH3 are three protons, right? They came out different. Protons in CH2 came out different. Protons in hydrogen came out what? Different. That was when the said, ah, so we can actually use this to determine the nature of protons around the party or in a particular compound. Are you getting it now? See, uh, so he actually now discovered that these three values depends on the chemical environment. These three values depend on the chemical environment. Is that okay? That these three values that you get here depend on the chemical environment of each of the protons. That although they are the same compound, they are the same, they are protons of the same compound, but they have different what chemical environment. When we're talking about chemical environment, we are actually talking about what is close to each of the proton. For instance, you know you agree with me that this CH3 proton is not in the same chemical environment as this CH2 proton. Why? Because this CH3, what is close to it is what? CH2. But this CH2, what is close to it is what? OH and what? CH3. So they are in different chemical what? environment. When we're talking about the chemical environment, we're actually talking about those things that are surrounding a particular what? Proton. Is that okay? So that is that. That was the beginning of the use of NMRO as a, a method for structural elucidation. Now, listen. But then, you know that we said that there is a shift in frequency. Right? Because they are supposed to have the same word, precisional frequency. But now we are having different what precessional frequency. So there is actually a shift in what frequency, which depends on the chemical environment, right? What brought about the shift in frequency? All frequencies are supposed to be the same, but there is now a shift. Some of them are having frequency higher than the other. And what brought about this was the chemical environment of the proton. And that was what now brought about what we all know today as what? Chemical shift. A shift in the precessional frequency. A shift in the precessional frequency, right? When the protons are in different chemical environment. Now, listen to now, if there's a shift in the precessional frequency, you know that the radio frequency that we must supply to the protons, according to what I said earlier, must be the same with the word, the precessional frequency. True or false? The radio frequency that we supply to the precessing nucleus must be the same with the word, must be equivalent to the precessional frequency for the resonance to take place. That is why they call it nuclear magnetic resonance. I explained it in the first video. That for resonance to take place, the radio frequency from the NMRO source, right, that you must actually supply must be equal to the precessional frequency that is brought about as a result of the what external magnetic field applied to the proton. So since we are now having different precessional frequency, something can be done. It means that the radio frequency that we'll be supplying to might likely what change true or false. And therefore we are going to be measuring different 
frequency for each of these what for each of these proton in the NMRO spectrum. And that is the reason why when you do the NMRO spectrum, these three things will not come as one peak, but rather they will come as I mean they will not come as one signal, but rather they will come as what different signals. Right, because we said that the precessional frequency, this radio frequency you actually uh, apply, um, should be the same as the precessional frequency, which we excite those low energy uh, protons towards high energy um, charges, which of course they will fall back. When they are falling back, the detector will uh, pick it, and then the signal will be given. Is that okay? Since the radio frequency now is not different. And the precessional frequency is not different. It means that for each of them, you'll be having different, different what signals. All right. So that is that. Now, so that is the general idea of what of what chemical shift is. When they say explain chemical shift, what are you not going to write? You say chemical shift is the change or the shift in precessional frequency for charges when an external magnetic field is applied due to different chemical environments of these charges or of the or don't say charges use nucleus right the change in the precessional frequency of nucleus right due to different chemical environments of these nucleus are seen in the nmro spectrum is what we call the chemical shift now the chemical shift of course we know that is measured is indicated with what the data sign right and we are going to look at how we can actually measure the chemical shift in subsequent lecture all right now to measure the precessional frequency is actually um, in absolute frequency unit, it's not difficult, right? What we are saying here now is we want to actually measure the precessional frequency of each of the individual proton. For instance, I've given to you that, for instance, you have CH3, CH2, OH. This one, we have different precessional frequency. This, we have different precessional frequency. This, we have different precessional frequency. Now, we need to actually measure the individual precessional frequency right we can measure the individual precessional frequency but most time it is not required do you understand because if we are doing that it means we are now using the individual precessional frequency in our what in our spectrum but most time you don't actually need that are you getting it now the difference in frequency is measured with respect to some group of nuclei for proton and carbotetin NMRO, the universally accepted standard is what tetramethylsilane. So you may be asked, what is the standard used in NMRO spectrum for measurement of chemical shift? The correct answer is what tetramethylsilane. What is tetramethylsilane? This is silane. This is the structure of silane. Now, when the hydrogen groups here have been substituted with CH3, you call it what? Tetramethylsilane. So, you are going to have something like this. All right? This tetramethylsilane. So, what we actually do is we measure the frequency of this one, measure the frequency of this, measure the frequency of this, and then... We subtract them from the frequency of what tetramethylsilane, also known as what TMS. Is that okay? So that is what is actually represented as the chemical shift. Instead of measuring the individual frequency, what we do is we use a standard, and then we measure the shift from the standard. Is that okay? So if the standard is like ten for TMS. It's like 10 and then you are having 11 instead of you writing 11 for this let's say this proton what you are going to write is the difference between 10 and 11 which is what one so the chemical shift in that case now will be what one now the question now is why is tms used why is tetramethylsilane used 
Now, if you look at tetramethylsilane very well, you discover that each of these CH3 group are in the same chemical environment. Now, when we talk about chemical environment, it means look around them. You discover that all of them are identical. You have this CH3. What you have close to it is CH3. To this side, what you have close to it is what? CH3. If you pick this one, what you have close to it at every side is CH3. And what? Silicon in the middle. So all of them are what? Chemically identical. In the same identical or in the same chemical, uh, equi uh, chemically equivalent uh, surrounding or environment. Hence, it will have a very sharp peak. If you look at them, you see that means tetramethylsilane will give just one peak because proton or let's say one signal rather protons in the same chemical environment give just one signal in nmro so it is expected that since all the protons here they are in chemically equivalent environment you should be expecting just one signal and if you look a total of how many protons are around this tetramethylsilane or are present in tetramethylsilane you have this one here has three plus three making it six plus three making it nine plus three making it what 12. so only this one has 12 protons and because it has 12 protons you'll be expecting a very sharp peak just one sharp signal just one but it will be very very sharp so even in such a way that even in small amount ah. Uh, if you place it even in small amount of sample, you'll be able to measure that this is the one for TMS. And then any shift from TMS now is now what you'll be what you'll be representing in your um spectrum as your what chemical shift. So the TMS is usually giving a chemical shift of what zero. So every other thing from TMS is actually uh, reported as a chemical shift with reference. To TMS so if you have a proton if you have let's say a proton that have a particular frequency what you do is to subtract that frequency from that of TMS and then that will give us what the chemical shift for TMS I'm going to show you how to calculate the chemical shift values anyway but the general understanding is that TMS is used as a standard so instead of us actually calculating the or noting the individual frequency we use the frequency of TMS to actually what get those of the other this thing by assuming that CMS have chemical shift of what zero. So whenever you see they ask you what standard is used for carbon 13 NMRO and proton NMRO, you say the correct answer is what TMS, which is tetramethylsilane. Now, why do we use tetramethylsilane? One, it is chemically inert. Two, it has low melting point, hence can be recovered from the sample. You know you are adding it to your sample, right? because you add it to your sample so that it will also give a signal then that signal now you are now going to compare with the signals from other functional ground from other protons in that sample now it is soluble in most organic compound tetramethylsilane is soluble in most organic compound and what you'll be assaying in most cases is organic compound hence the use of what tetramethylsilane it can be added to sample as internal world standard so that is that. So tetramethylsilane is the standard that is actually what used. I'm going to teach us to calculate the um the chemical shift um values, but this is the most important. So what is the general idea or what is the good spell I'm trying to appreciate? What I'm telling you is that one protons in the same chemical environment we have the same signal. So tetramethylsilane, we just have one signal. And the signal will be very sharp and very visible, very conspicuous. Why? Because you have about 12 protons. So each of them will make it tick, tick. Are you getting it down? And then every other this thing we are going to get, every other frequency we are going to get, we are going to actually, um, we are going to, let me say, write it with reference to what? Tetramethylsilane. So we are not measuring absolute frequency now we are not measuring individual frequency but rather we are measuring the frequency with respect to tetramethylsilane is that okay so that is that now let's see how to calculate the chemical shift now the chemical shift uses this is the chemical shift of compound x is 
the first thing you have here is the frequency of the compound. That means the precessional frequency of the compound. You know, I told you that the compound itself, we have the sample you want to make. You have the sample. Let's say this is the organic compound eh, that you want to actually send to the NMRO machine. You add TMS to it. This is TMS. You now put them inside the machine. Now, this TMS will be the first to actually give a very strong peak because it's easily, you can easily, eh? It's very, very, it's very sensitive, right? And it has 12 protons. And it's usually very, very easy for you to detect it as compared to others. So it will first be the first one that will actually show this peak like this. And most time, tetramethylsilane actually have a precessional frequency equivalent to 60 megahertz. Is that okay? 60 megahertz. And every other compound will have precessional frequency a little bit higher than 60 megahertz. Is that okay? The 60 megahertz is still the same thing as 60 million hertz. You should take note of that. So most times when you send it to the machine, this will be the first to actually show. Then later, let's say the compound X, the precessional frequency of that compound, you start adjusting it. Maybe that compound now will start showing at, let's say, 60 million, let's say 121 just a little bit ahead rather just a little bit ahead of what the 60 million hertz let's say the other protons on the compound will show at 60 million then you are now going to have 141 so instead of re uh, reporting all of them as 60 million uh, then 60 million for tetramethylsilane then 60 million 121 60 million 141 all you just need to do is report them in the chemical shift values. And that is where we come across or where, where we actually uh, start using this idea of what chemical shift to work. So the chemical shift for, say VS is the chemical shift for compound X. V, um, okay, V, uh, not VS, this symbol here, Delta is the chemical shift for compound S. Vs is the precessional frequency of X. Vtms is the precessional frequency of TMS in Hertz. Vo is the precessional fre operating fre uh, f or let's say frequency of operating device. In megahertz, please take note, the precessional frequency must be in Hertz. That of TMS must be in Hertz. But the frequency of the operating device must be in what? Megahertz. You should take note. Frequency of the operating device must be in what? In megahertz. Is that okay? Now, that is that. Now, another thing that you also need to know, methods used for measuring... um precessional frequency or chemical shift you have two methods one is called the continuous wave method you should just read about this one and the other one is the pulse technique and Fourier transform now this continuous wave method is what we call continuous wave nmro why this fourier transform is what we call ft nmro these are the two methods of measuring what um chemical shift is that okay now let's see in the in your spectrum you usually draw the chemical shift and uh, the what you actually represent is the chemical shift now listen this area is called low frequency area 
why this area is called the high frequency area this low frequency area that is where you have tms at zero point is called up field so when you have a very low chemical shift you say up field now when you have a low chemical shift i mean a very high chemical shift you call it what down field is that okay down field when your chemical shift is very high right you call it what high field i mean you call it down field when your chemical shift is very high that means frequency is high to chemical shift high frequency is what high to you call it down field chemical shift is low frequency is also low you call it what up field so if they say between up field and down field which one will have the highest chemical shift of course up field we have a lower chemical shift while down field we have a higher chemical shift so if you say a shift to lower frequency you say is what up field shift a shift to higher frequency down field shift is that okay so that is that so when you are representing you actually draw from this side like this so if this one is like zero this one may be like one year will be like two year will be like three year will be like four year will be like what five so when it is progressing towards this side the chemical shift is increasing the frequency is increasing you say it is what down field not because this one's half up you feel is actually higher mm -mm. the one down field are the one with higher chemical shift higher frequency all right let's use the idea of chemical shift to solve one or two question all right now the question says let me be quick with this the question says um this oa signal on the spectrum is 144 hertz higher than tms now what did i tell you that the value for tms is most time it is usually tms the frequency for tms is usually 60 megahertz which is approximate to 6 million hertz because i told you that that of tms you must convert it to hertz now they say the oh signal of a spectrum so that of the oh is r v s which is the frequency of the compound the compound now is oh right this one is vtms frequency of not v rather but we can use v to represent it the frequency of tms this one is that of the compound now it is one four four higher than so it means if this one is six million this one will be i mean 60 million this one will be 60 million one four four heads when you say 144 higher than it means you add it to that of this one here is that okay now most of the operating device like i told you so that of vo of the operating device is usually 60 megahertz that is the reason why tms immediately you put it it will detect tms we actually process first or it will resonate with it right so the the frequency the radio frequency of the operating device is about 60 megahertz now let us actually solve this now what is the chemical shift i told you to calculate is vx minus vtms over vo now this one should be in megahertz don't convert it to hertz why this other one must be converted to hertz so vts i mean vx is what 60 million 144 minus 60 million for tms divided by what 60 don't convert this to hertz i'm shouting this don't convert this to hertz leave it in megahertz so at the end of the day this will give us if you subtract this is going to give us 144 divided by 60 and 144 divided by 60 
is 2.4. Now, the chemical shift is measured in parts per million. You may be asked, what is the unit for chemical shift? It's part per million. All right? Part per what? Per million. So, your correct answer now is 2.44 parts per million. Is that okay? That is the correct answer. 2.44 part per million. All right. Let's see another question. The signal for CH2 in the NMRO spectrum of benzyl alcohol appears at... Now, they gave you the chemical shift value. 4.6. Calculate... That is part per million, of course. Calculate the difference in frequency expressed in hertz. Now, what are we calculating? Difference in frequency. That means between that of TMS and benzyl alcohol in a, in a 300 megahertz NMRO spectrum. So it means the, operate, the frequency of the operating device in this case, which is VO, was given as what? 300 megahertz. Because they give, give to you that in a 300 megahertz NMRO spectrum. But most time, if it's not given to you, just use the 60 megahertz because most of the devices usually use that 60 megahertz. So this one is 300 megahertz. Now, what are we actually looking for? We are giving this. The formula is X minus VTMS. Now, what we are looking for is this stuff you have on top here. The difference. So let me represent this with X. Right? What you are looking for is different between this and this. So we can say that this is X all over VO. Of course, remember that this one must be in megahertz. On no account should you convert 300 megahertz to 300 million hertz. On no account should you do that. But your answer will still remain in hertz because we know that everything on top here must be converted to what? To hertz. So this will be 4.6 is equals to X divided by 300 megahertz. Of course, this is over 1. You cross multiply. This is going to give us x will be equals to 4.6 times 300. x will be equals to 4.6 times 300. It gave me here. I don't know if it's correct. You can check it later. 1380 hertz. Give us 1380 hertz. So that is your answer as to this. All right? So that's where we are going to stop for this lecture. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.